Okay, um, I'm Lance Butters. I'm also known as Nemus uh, on DC801. Uh, we're on Freenode, uh, pound DC801. Uh, these are our websites, dc01.org, the transistor. This is my site where I kind of keep, there's a copy of this presentation there, but it's an older one. This is a little bit more updated. Um, I work I work for the payment processor. Uh, I code in PHP, but I also um, do server setup. So basically what I'm going to talk about is uh, the scenario, like I don't know how many guys run VPS, virtual private servers. Anybody? Nobody? You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, so when you buy a VPS, you pay like, what, five bucks, one of the virtual private servers and you get an IP address and your server. So you have no firewall in between your VPS and the internet. So what do you do? So you want to do, you're going to be doing your own firewall. So a lot of people will ask, why even bother? IP tables is kind of a pain, right? So any questions, well, why you would use IP tables over something else? I mean, you can use Surewall. There's a million other things. Why would you use IP tables? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of great examples. Um, another thing is, is you get a lot more. You get really a lot more control with it. Uh, a lot of these other th utilities kind of abstract out the firewall rules, so you can't really see what's going on. So this is this is it. I mean, when you have a VPS, this is the internet, and this is you. I mean, you got to stop the world from trying to get into your your server. If you're running your own application out there, you know you want to configure your firewall set. So what is what is IP tables? What does it do? Anybody here know? Open whole set of rules for managing uh, your input and your output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 filter chains, so it's it's hooks inside the kernel. So it looks when when the packet comes into the Linux kernel, IP tables is there looking to see what comes in, and so there's a bunch of different chains that you can look at. The most common one is the filter table. So there's the there's tables, there's like the pre routing, post routing, input, output. And then you have your chains. And so you apply your chains to the table. And the chain is your list of rules. So we have IP tables, chains, and then rules. Does that make sense? OK, so this is the, the filter table. And it's got three chains, input, output, and forward. What does input do? Input is all the traffic coming into your server. So anything with the source destination of your server is going to come into input. And then after that, we have the output table. Everything going out of your server is the output table. So we have stuff coming in, we have stuff coming out. Well, what if for some reason you wanted your your server to just pass traffic? Well, that's the forward table. So that's some that's a packet coming into an interface and then going out another interface. So we can set rules for just this server and coming in and coming out, and then we can set rules for packets that are transversing the server. Um, here's a table example. So I'm going to describe the command a little bit. What, this IP tables command is dash L, so I'm listing. Um, I'm doing dash N, which is saying, I don't want you to resolve DNS because it takes forever to resolve the DNS. So you, I always do dash N. The dash X tells me I want to see how many packets are actually being hit by this rule. So here I can see this rule, 9,998 9, 9, packets have hit this accept rule for localhost. So right there I can actually see is my rule actually doing anything. And down here is the forward policy. So I'm listing this chain here, 
or this table, I'm listing all of the chains in this table. That's the default table, which is the filter table. The next table we're going to talk about is the NAT table. The NAT table has three additional chains. It has the post chain, post routing chain, or pre routing chain, post routing chain, and output chain. So like before, the output chain is for, or is for local NAT uh, packets on the firewall. So pre-routing. Pre-routing is before we do any routing, we hit the routing table. Post-routing, that's after we hit the routing table. So that's the routing decision has been made. Now the packet's going to go wherever it's supposed to go. If you want to get in front of the input chain, you can get in before the you know, apply rules, you can use the pre-routing chain. This will also affect all forwarding packets in the filter table. Is anybody, uh, am I, is everybody following me? Are we all good? Any questions? Because I, I have a tendency to get nervous, and when I'm nervous, I talk really fast, and I go really fast. So I'm trying to slow myself down. So if you guys get lost, just raise your hand and be like, please help me. Okay, so here's a NAT table example. So here we're using the T command. I'm saying I want the NAT, uh, the NAT table. And I want to look at all the chains in the NAT table. And then again, N, X, and V. The V is verbose. X shows me how many packets are actually being affected. And then there's the mingle table. So what would we use the mingle table for? Yep, load balancing. You know any other ideas? Yep, you can set the QoS bit on your packets. So, you know, in the uh, TCP header, you can say this packet has this priority. You can actually manipulate it, and all the packets leaving your server, you can say, I want them to have the highest priority. And if someone down the chain is actually looking at that, then you can take advantage of it. It's just kind of a little small little hack. You may not, you might not get the prioritization, but at least your packets are marked like this is really important. So we have a mangle table example here. Um, these are these are all empty by default, um, but you can set the pre-routing input, output, forward, post-routing. Uh, later on, I'll show you how uh, all these tables fit in through the packet flow and everything. All right, and then there's the raw table. This is this is kind of like a, if you're going to really play with IP tables functionality, you can kind of play in the raw table. It's kind of after everything's been done. And then we just show the raw. So here, here's kind of the flow of IP tables, and this is where I got the image from, so I'm not plagiarizing, just linking back. Um, so we see the, the packet coming in, it hits the mangle table and the pre-routing, and then the NAT pre-routing chain. So the mangle table chain gets executed before the pre-routing chain um, here on the NAT table. So you can mingle before you do any network address translation. Now, all of these chains are predefined. You can actually, I don't, well, you can create your own chains too. So if you want to, you know, connect to any of these, if you want to get really advanced, you can go in there and actually mess, change this entire infrastructure to whatever you want. But this is kind of how it's set up by default. So we have the pre-routing chain. Um, on Mangle, the pre-routing chain on NAT hits the routing table. Now, now we say, is this data for our server or for, you know, the firewall is in this server? Yes, it is. Okay, input chain. So we see here, three chains have already fired before we even get to input chain. So if you want to do anything, you know, pre-routing wise, you can Mangle it and do all these fire before here. So this is the Mangle chain input. And then the filter table input chain. So mangle always goes before filter. This is the filter one. So this is the IP tables dash L, the default one you're going to see. And then finally the packet reaches the process. 
So we've come in here, we've got a packet coming in from a network, comes in here, is for a server, hits our actual process, our web server, our FTP server, or whatever we're, we're using. All right, so we've got data in. Now we do data out. First, it hits the routing table. Where does it go? I don't know. We need to send it somewhere. Okay, it's determined where the routing is. Now we're going to go to the mangle table output chain. Then we're going to hit the NAT table output chain. And then we're going to hit the filter table output chain. Then we're going to hit the mangle table post routing because we're done. We're done with all of this, so we're going to hit the post routing chain. And then we're going to hit the post routing chain on NAT table two. Then we're out. So this is the entire cycle of all the chains for incoming packet and then the response. Do we have any questions? It's good? Makes sense? Confusion? OK. So what if we're just filtering? Do the same routing. Hit the mingle table for forward chain, filter table forward. Manage table forward, post routing chain, NAT post routing chain, packets go out. All right, so these are the target values. So when you're writing your IP tables command, these are the things that you can do with the packet. So what who can tell me the difference between reject and drop? Yep. Which one's better? Yeah. You know, people were spoofing packets and you're sending rejects out. Yeah. So I always use drop mainly because if I can't get to it, I don't really I don't need it to tell me that hey it's blocked. So you know, I know it's not gonna work. I mean if you if you want the reject, you want the message, I don't think it's even worth bothering. I mean there might be scenarios where you need it, I don't know. I've never I have never had a reason to use reject. And then so you can, another nice thing is you can log. You can say, well, I don't want to reject it, but I, I want to log every time I see this traffic. So you can send log, you can send packets directly to your syslog so you can look and see what's actually going on in your network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. The return, it, it'll just stop. It'll just be like, okay, whatever, return. You know, so if you want it, you see, so if you have a match and you say, I want everything, um, once I've matched this traffic, I just want it to return. It'll stop the chain. Yeah, it'll, yeah. All right, so matches. You want to match the source. So you want to match the, the, the IP address of the incoming packet, or do you want to match the destination? Um, you can match the protocol, uh, ICMP or TCP. Uh, the interface. So if you want, if you want to say, you know, this is the incoming interface. So I saw the traffic coming in on ETH zero, out interface, or the packet's going out. State. Um, so if you want to do state, stateful firewall inspection, that used to be the big thing. Everything now is the AppSec. 
You can actually do AppSec stuff with uh, IP tables. You can throw in regexes and stuff. I'll talk a little bit about that more, but I don't, not many people do that just because it's a pain. But you can do that. So does everybody know how, what stateful firewalls do? Anybody have questions? Yes. Uh, how are the current packages being handled? Um, well, UDPs don't have uh, states, right? Because this. But, but for the high dependent type, it also contains the git package or the main or how we recognize that. Oh, well, for the TCP connections, it, it makes sure that you're actually following a stateful connection. So it'll say, see, are you sending an ACK? Are you sending a SYN? Um, and all that stuff. I don't. I haven't worked much with UDP. Um, I was under the impression that UDP didn't have state because you're basically just firing a packet and hoping that they receive the packet, right? So, if you're having any connection management with UDP, it would be at a layer seven. If I, unless I'm wrong, I could be wrong. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the connection tracking on UDP is its own thing. Because UDP was designed to just send a packet and be done with it, not to manage any state or anything like that. I haven't worked much with that. All right. Missed stuff. OK. So we did interface, string. So the string. Um, is kind of the application layer data. So if you want your rule to, like I said before, if you want to, if you want to write a regex to kind of see, look for some malware or some weird stuff, the application layer. I mean, if you can, you know, obviously if it's SSL, you can't decrypt it, so it's just going to be a long line of encryption. But you can do all your appsec stuff. You just don't have the predefined rules, but I'm sure there's stuff out there. All right, so key points. Rules contain a criteria and a target. If the criteria is matched, it goes to execute the specific rule. All right, so if it matches, if the, if the rule matches, the packet matches the rule, it executes, you know, the accept, drop, all that stuff. If it's not matched, it moves on to the next rule. So the top rule is going to be executed before the last rule. We'll go over some examples. So now we'll do some examples. Oh, you guys big Lord of the Rings fans? I know. I like the analogy. I thought it was a good analogy because, you know, in that movie, if you think about Gandalf doesn't cast a lot of magic. He just stops bad things from happening. That's what, you know, firewalls do. All right, so... What we're going to go through, this is a book I've been reading on Linux firewalls. I'll, I'll get show you the book. It's no starch press. But I'm going to go basically through. They have an example that they publish, and it's here's the, IP, uh, the URL for their example. We're going to be going over that. So basically, this is a bash script. And on all my servers, I set up this bash script, and I modify it. And so well, the first thing is, is, is anybody running IP version 6? All right, first thing you do, turn it off. I cannot tell you, people leave IP version 6, and the great thing about IP version 6 is it will configure itself. It will set up its own network. So, if, like, let's say you have a, a hosting provider and they have IP version 6 on for some reason, one of their machines get compromised. Well, you know, they, they're just playing with IP version 6 and they got this network set up and they're not really doing anything. They don't even have any security. Well, the, a lot of the times what will happen is the machine will get compromised on IP version 4 and then they'll start attacking on IP version 6 because nobody's even thinking about IP version 6. So turn it off. So what we're going to do here is we're going to load um, the path to the IP version 6 tables and then the path to the IP tables into a var bash variable. And then we're going to load our internal network and our inner interface and our exit interface. This, is, this example is for using Linux as a firewall. But I found, like, the, you know, actual natted translated firewall. Oh, 
Okay, so dash F. We're going to remove all the rules from the chain in the filter table. Then dash F the NAT table. We're going to remove all the rules. So the first thing we do is just get rid of whatever was in there. So when I run the script, I want it to purge everything, and then we're going to reload everything. Then we're going to dash X is just going to delete any user change or any um, additional stuff we might have put in there. All right, and then we're going to set the default policy. So the IP tables, big P, chain, input, drop. So on the filter chain, on the filter table, the last thing we do once we've gone through the entire filter table on the input chain, once we've gone through that entire chain, we are going to drop packets. Because if it, we're not, we're going to go from a whitelisting model, so we're just going to let things in, not try and stop things from you know, pick specific targets. We're going to deny all. That's your implicit deny all. And then we're going to do the same thing for IP version 6. Uh, we're going to drop input, output, and forward on the filter table. We're just going to drop anything IP version 6. All right, so what is this command doing here? We're looking for um, we're looking for invalid states in the TCP handshake. So basically, we're looking for N map scans or any type of scan where they're maybe just sending maybe just a SIN packet or an ACK packet or they're doing a Christmas tree, you know, um, a scan. We're saying if you're not following the TCP handshake rules, I want to log it. And then if you're not doing it, we're going to drop it. So if you're going to send me um, session connection states out of order, we're going to drop it. This is the new. This feature right here was the big thing with the PIX 501 and all that old, you know, old stuff. You know, back in the day, they had to say you have to have a stateful firewall. Or you're just not secure. Basically, all it is is saying, "Hey, are you actually following the TCP handshake rules?" Okay. So here we have an, an input, and then we have the anti-spoofing rules. So here we're going to say, "Hey." If you're outside my network and you're going to say that you're going to send me a packet that's destined for my internal network, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to drop it. I'm going to log it too. But I'm going to say, if you're trying to spoof my internal network, so has anyone ever ran into this scenario, seen this on their firewall? Yeah, I had a problem. I had a very interesting attack happen on my home network because I didn't turn this on. So I was running a mail server at my house just because I like my mail at my house. And so I, I was running a microtech, and I didn't configure it properly. And I allowed spoof network. And they would send the packets in, and send e they're using my, my mail server to relay spam. And I got shut down. I got, it took me forever to get my IP address off of all of those spam, you know, block lists. Because once you get on those block lists, they don't care. I pretty much just told them, like, I need a new IP address. <laughs> All right, so what about this? Let's see. Well, this one. This one's really important. This one we're just logging. But what about this one? What does this one do? Yeah, you want to, you, by default, you want to let all your local um, loopback traffic to talk. I mean, you can talk to yourself all night. That's pretty safe, right? <laughs> you hope, yeah. Well, if they can talk to local host, you're, 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 you're screwed anyway. So, but yeah, there you'd be surprised. There are a lot of stuff that will actually talk to itself. I mean, there's a lot of um, stuff going on in the loopback address, like processes talking to each other and stuff like that. So make sure you always enable loopback if your default policy is to drop. 
All right, so we, we're, we're, we're limiting stuff that comes in, but, you know, what about stuff that goes out? Most people don't really set their output firewalls. And why would you want to block outbound traffic? Yep. So, you know, the CTF right here, when you run an exploit, you send an exploit, you send, uh, you send uh, code, they're saying, um, hey, there, here's this code that, which is going to give me uh, execution on the processor. You have a chunk of code that's execution on the processor that gets you to that point, and then you have shell code. And what the shell code does is it runs, once the, you've gotten to the point where your code, you can actually get the processor to run your code, the shell code is what runs, and it'll dial back. So it'll say, oh, okay, I'm running. I'm going to bring up a, a connection, a shell, to outbound. So even if you get compromised inbound-wise, blocking your outbound traffic makes it a lot more difficult to get those connections out. It's actually, I think, you know, in, input's obvious. You know, if you don't block your input, you're just, you're just gonna, you're sitting out there out in the wind. But output you need to block output for stuff you're not using because you don't want, if you do get compromised, you don't want them to actually do anything on your system. Now, I mean, your, a virus might do what it's programmed to do, but you don't want it to actually participate in the botnet or whatever they're trying to use your system for. Let's see. Let's go over this a little bit. So does anyone have any questions about the syntax? You know, port uh, protocol TCP destination port 22, um, connection track state new, accept. So we're going to accept inbound connections for TCP on 22. So what's the difference between your connection check module and your state module? I remember probably the state. syntax is a dash f state. Mm -hmm. I think this actually, I can't remember. I know this just enables the stateful tracking. I'll have to look, that's something I'm going to have to look up. But So you're talking about what the difference between M table, M state, and C state would be? The default variable policy of M state. Yeah, I don't know. This is, like I said, the, the no starch Linux firewall, this is what he used. That's kind of what my talk's about. I have to. That's interesting. I'll, I, I have. I have noticed that difference. I just never um, investigated it. Yeah. So we're letting we're letting HTTP out, 22 out, 25, 43, which I can't remember what that is. We're letting DNS out, port 53. We're letting echo request out. So we're letting, we're gonna let them ping us. Maybe you want want to drop ping. All right, and then forward chain. So we're gonna log again. We're gonna log stateful. And we're gonna drop invalid. And then we're gonna apply uh, anti-spoofing rules. So why why do we need spoofing rules? So let's say that this machine is our firewall, and we have it's doing NAT and everything for us. Why do we have spoofing rules for the input table and then the forward table? Well, the yeah. Yes, exactly. So before we said we don't want to spoof. We don't. We're not going to accept any spoof packets to the firewall. Now we're going to say we're not going to forward any spoof packets either. So um, in this example, if uh, if the in interface, if it's not the in interface, um, and its source is the internal, if it's not the, uh, if it's not the internal interface, and the source is the external interface, drop it. Or the source is the internal network, drop it. So we're not going to let any spoof packets transfer through our network. Then more forward chain. So these are the packets that we're going to allow through. Oh, here's a netting example. 
So, so if we want to have Linux configured as our firewall, and we want it to do network address translation, all, this is the command we use here. So we're going to set it in the NAT table, apply it to post routing. So before any routing is done, we're going to do the network address translation. And so we're going to say any, uh, any source on the internal network with the source external interface J masquerade. So we're going to masquerade, um, we're going to masquerade as the IP address on the external interface. And then we're allowing a couple of ports to be translated to servers or computers that are inside our normal network. All right, so who knows about this? What does this do? Yep, it allows packets to actually transverse through your system. Is this a good or bad thing? Depends, right? If you're a server, don't turn this on. If you're a firewall, you probably need it. So what, why wouldn't you want to turn this on if you're, if you're running like a VPS and all you have is a web server with you know, PHP running? Yeah, so you don't want them using your, your VPS as a router. Because then they can, if this is enabled, and they've got, maybe they don't have full root access, but they have some system access, they can try and use your, your virtual private server to route packets and try and do a man in the middle attack against other people. So you want to make sure that's turned off unless you're using a Linux as a firewall. All right, so here, here are the commands um, you use. So I talked about a little bit this, about this earlier. So again, no network, verbose, and I want to see how many packets actually hit the, the rule. To me, this is the most useful thing because I, if you write a rule and it's not detecting anything, is it working? You don't know. Um, L can show the line name, number. Flush the tables, that uh, IP tables dash F just deletes everything. If you want to delete a chain, so if you wanted to see your chain, you go you go line number. Is dash n line number? Maybe that's the n. I don't remember. I have to look up again. Yeah, I might have that wrong. So you delete, you append chains here. Adds to the bottom. Adds above the rule. Anybody have questions about the syntax or these rules? Yeah. Definitely. That's why that's why I, I I work in a script first, then I apply the script. And then I'll usually um, have something that like, so like if you're working in a Cisco, you know, you maybe you'll, you'll set the system to automatically reboot an hour. So if for some reason you lock yourself out, you can, it'll reboot and reload the old config and you can get back in. So I'll, I'll have some, I'll have set up a bash script. So I'll, I'll edit the script and I'll copy the old script and I'll set up a, an act command and say, hey, in an hour I want you to reload the old config just in case I lock myself out. All right, so this is, this is a cool little trick here. So let's say you have a squid server. You ever, everybody know what squid does? HTTP proxy. So let's say you want to monitor all the traffic. So you can set up the, the NAT rules here and redirect all 80, port 80 to 3128. So it'll automatically use the squid server. So any traffic coming in or being filtered through your um, Linux box is actually going to go through a squid server. So you could set up two NICs on a server, bridge those two NICs, drop it in place, and then you can sniff all the, uh, so you, you know, install squid, you can sniff all the uh, port 80 traffic. 
All right, so that's pretty much for IP tables. Next, I'm going to talk about just kind of some of the other things you can do with Linux. Um, so uh, there's traffic control. Um, have, has anyone in here worked with traffic control at all? So this is kind of this is kind of a neat little script I set up if you want to do rate limiting. Um, you still need to use IP tables. So what? So how traffic control works is you have the IP tables tells uh, the packet where the filter is going to be. So you you mark the packet with IP tables, and then um, traffic control takes over and creates the queues for you. So here, with traffic control, we're going to create a queuing discipline. And we're going to add it to the device bridge zero root handle. And we're going to use the HTTP queuing protocol, or algorithm, or whatever it is. And so then I'm, here I'm creating, uh, I'm creating classes here. So I have one, five, and six. And they bridge off the parent. So I'm going to let this, the first class is going to have a rate of this speed. The second class is going to have, um, okay, so yeah, this is the parent class. So this is how fast your connection is. This is how much your, your, your ceiling is going to be. Or am I right? No. Yeah, this is, this, is the total, this is the total speed of the connection. And then here, you're going to set the rate. So here I'm just saying, you know, the rate is this. And then that's their ceilings. This so this is um, what they're given normally, and this is what they can go to. Do the same thing for here, and then say I'm saying um, one three three. I'm marking six. So I'm saying this IP address. If I see any packets come in from this IP address, I want it to go to this queuing discipline and rate it at this speed. And this is outbound, I believe. Or inbound. Yeah, that's inbound connections. These are outbound. And so here I'm doing the same thing. If I see, If I see 133, 134, 135, I'm sending them to the class 15, which has a higher higher rate. Um, these are VLANs. Oh. But anyway, I thought I'd talk a little bit about VLANs. Um, you have to install the, the mod pro, the dot queuing. But you can set VLANs on your interfaces. So you can, if, the, if you receive packets that are tagged, you can say, okay, I want E0 to have a sub. And I don't Cisco, they call them sub interfaces. I don't know if that's a proprietary statement or whatever. But so here I'm saying this is a sub interface 10, sub interface 5, sub interface 30. So all of these, what I'm doing is I'm creating a, a virtual interface that's going to strip off that uh, tag and then apply it to that interface. Oh, I got slides out of order. So all right. So now that you have your, you know, you have your system uh, VLAN, you can set up bridges. So uh, I run KVM a lot. Uh, that's actually what we're running our hostel network on there over with. So one thing that's nice about that is, you know, maybe you have servers that you want on one network, but not on another network, but you want them on the same virtual machine or the same virtual host. So you can set up you can set up trunking to your your KVM server, and then you can tie. So here I'm going to tie Ethernet 1.0, the sub interface. You can tie it to a bridge. So here, so this is the BR control show command, and so I'm I'm tying Ethernet 1.0 to bridge 10. And then after that, I can throw in as many virtual machines onto that bridge, and they will get all their packets um, tagged when they leave the virtual host. All right, uh, these are some things to set for your operating system defense. 
like I talked before. Um, so you want to uh, disable, these are some good commands to disable. Um, the sync, like the TCP sync cookies, it uh, turns on protection for denial of service attack. Disable responding to pings. Um, so here, like if you want to just tell your system to ignore pings, you can go there and turn that off. Disable all redirects. Fun stuff. There's more information in the link there. Talked about bridges. All right, so these are some great uh, resources. This is the Linux firewalls books, the No Starch. That's the script that we just went over. So we've kind of just covered a little bit of chapter one on this book. This book is great because the first two or three chapters are okay. These are it goes through all the layers. So it starts with IP tables, and then it goes you know layer three, four, five, or five, six, and seven. And it gets up to the application layer. And if you want to do the application layer filtering, um, it talks about PSAD which I haven't gone to yet, which looks interesting. It's a personal snort uh, intrusion detection, I think. It uses snort rules. So if you want to run, um, if you want to run snort rules on your Linux box, you can use that. So anyway, uh, that's IP table. So I wanted to see, like, what, what would Windows have that would be kind of uh, IP tables equivalent? And there wasn't much, but there is some stuff. I haven't really played with it a lot. Um, but here's some links. You can use the NetSSH firewall, uh, NetSSH advanced firewall, other stuff. Here's an example of a rule. Net add firewall, add rule name. So this should block port. 80 from any remote IP address. Uh, the reason I kind of went through this is, um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with our CTF game. Right now we have a free-for-all CTF where we just have some machines you attack. Um, our other ones we run, we have teams. So on our CTFs for DC801, we have a team of you know three or four people. And you have servers that you have to defend. And basically, um, they're just set up for you and you have to go through and configure them. Well, the quick way to do that is to have a firewall script ready to go and just hit enter. So I wanted to script a lot of firewalling on Linux boxes, you know, still, cause you still have to let traffic in. So in the, in the C, in the team CTF, there's a scoring server and the scoring server will go out and ping all of the services on the machines. So you have to let the scoring server traffic in but you don't want the other team's traffic in. So you got to figure out, okay, what is their IP address? What subnets are they coming from? And what subnet is the scoring server on? So, you, you know, to make the game more interesting, you have to configure your firewall to let the correct traffic in. All right, level up. Any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, for the TCP and UDP connections, the kernel maintains a mapping in the proc file system. Does the kernel maintain any mapping for the IP tables in the proc file system? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not, I wasn't following you. Uh, oh, okay. So for the TCP connections, uh -huh. we can check uh, slash proc slash net slash TCP check that file from all the TCP connections. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are any file in the proc file system, it's related to the IP tables or the traffic control. Um, well, the IP tables, um, I think, yeah, the kernel maintains the session connections, and the IP tables applies the drop, uh, drops the packet when, um, when, it, when it detects the sessions out of order. So the kernel should maintain the, the connection states. Yeah, but can I see from the prop file system? I think so. I'm not. I'll have to look that up. That would be yes. actually interesting. Yes. So well, from which key? I I try. I guess. I, okay. I've searched a long time from the internet, but I can't figure it out. It's it's all there. Well, it's all the net filter capability that's within the kernel and the maintains in the box. Okay. Is there IP tables? So probably. Is.
Yeah, because in Cisco you have the X light table, right? You can see all the states. I think it should be fine. The thing that you're going to run into the most with running Linux through the firewall is its processor memory intensive. Um, I think it's all ran inside the, uh, yeah, it's all ran in software. So I mean, like you, you buy a Cisco device, I mean, their their old routers, when well, last time I looked, they're like 500 megahertz, but they're doing everything in hardware. So all they're doing, all the filter checking, all the access control list, it's all hardware. For Linux, you're doing everything in software, so obviously there's going to be some bloat. But you just need to make sure that you have um, RAM and CPU. And they have a performance increase too? Yeah. IP sets. IP sets? They're a user space hashing algorithm. So that all of the you know, source port, destination port, source address, all that can be set up in a hash where the lookup is extremely quick mm -hmm. instead of going through a whole bunch of linear chains. Uh, as one example, one of my tasks mm -hmm. is I have to run calibration except for yeah. certain countries. Mm -hmm. um, and with this, I can set up a, an IP set which gives monthly updates on every area on, or every AppNet allocation. Mm -hmm. And it has all those networks. And then it has every AppNet allocation to the countries I want to allow. So if any packet coming in, I'm saying, hey, go out and match this AppNet catch. Does, does it match? Okay, does it match these? Any one of the good countries, okay, let me through. And we can saturate and write that line that way with no CPU. The hashing is so much faster. What was the name of that? IP set. IP set. IP set. Well, it's part of that filter package. I'll have to look into that. That sounds pretty cool. Good idea. So it just hashes the packet and then matches the IP address. Yeah, it basically replaces all of your IP table rules with hashes. Hash. And there are many different types of hashes depending on what exactly what matches. Yeah, I run, um, I run uh, PFSense at my house. Uh, I run Linux server. I don't know, I change my firewall all the time. So, um, right, well, so right now what I'm running is I'm running a KVM server. It has PFSense, has a Linux firewall, has a bunch of other stuff, and I swap out between them. And nobody in my house has ever complained about you know, connections or anything. So you should be good. In a corporate environment, you'd probably, I, I don't know, I worked at a place where we used Linux firewalls corporately, and they seem to work fine, um, but like I said, you just got to watch out for CPU and memory. Okay. 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 In a corporate environment, they're just having one dedicated yes. to the firewall. Yeah. No, I, yeah, in a corporate environment, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and put a bunch of stuff on there. So yes. for my own network, I just have a, a, a virtual machine that I use dedicated to the actual firewall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just, uh, I don't know if that's bad to be doing it, but it's a ESXi server. Um, with one of the yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, does it work? I mean, have you had any problems with them? Not that I know of yet, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, the, they're, so, I've been kind of... Fo I, I follow the secure... You know, I follow the security community a little bit, and... There, there's been a couple of host exploits, but you know, virtualization, there hasn't been much in the way of, like once you've got a guest system um, compromised, there hasn't been much in the way of like getting the guest system from the guest system to the actual host server that, that we're aware of. I mean, 
I imagine if someone figured that out for ESXi, it would be a game changer. If, if there was a vulnerability in ESXi where there was a guest where you could escalate from the guest to the host machine, think of the damage that would cause just everything. You could wreak havoc. Because, I mean, guest machines get compromised all the time. If you can get into the host, you know, you've got access. You, now you've gone from one server access to however many machines are running on that uh, VM host. But I think you're fine. Let's say the closest I've seen for a uh, cross virtual machine uh, exploiting is if you generate a public and private key on one server, it's using the same hardware set, set as another server. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that it's easy to, or easier to figure out what the key that was generated on the second machine was. So you can do a lot of the keys, the, a lot of the attacks that way. Yeah. Yeah, one, one problem with virtual machines. Um, so a lot of your crypto algorithms are dependent on random, or you random, I think. Yeah, you random. Yeah, Dan Kamiski did a great talk about this at DerbyCon. Um, he talked about how, like, with our virtual machines, you random is not getting any random data. So keys you generate. That's why we have the SSL collisions. Um, I guess they did uh, one of the security companies. They did a um, uh, test and they looked at all the certs, you know, all the SSL certs that are published outside, uh, you know, on the public network. And they realized that a lot of these certs actually were colliding. Like they, the same keys generated for this cert were actually the same for this one. So you could take this cert and say, "Hey, I'm this guy," and that guy could say he was you because you have the same private key. And they found out that that was caused by you random not getting any data in the virtual machine because you random depends on keyboard input, disk spinning. You know, a lot of things that when you virtualize a machine, a lot of that random data is not being generated because the virtual machine's disk's not spinning a whole lot. It's not spinning randomly. Yeah, Dan Kaminsky, he's got a great talk about that. He talks about he wants to move from a system, instead of using random input from users, using a system where we, we rely on clock sync difference to, um, get, to get random data which is kind of interesting. He said it's not as good, you know, it's not as good as um, using random data from a user or your humans, but it does provide a higher rate of less collisions on SSL certs. But going back to what you said, I think running a virtual firewall on a virtual machine is fine just as long as you have the resources to keep up with your bandwidth and your users. And obviously, you're not if you're not exposing the traffic to, uh, you know, you're not exposing the host publicly to the internet. But I could be wrong. Who knows? Okay. Thank you.